Twelve centuries ago, railways began as nothing more than wooden planks guiding mine carts beneath German hillsides, long before anyone imagined the steel giants racing at 300 kilometers an hour today. The evolution of railway tracks fueled empires, industrial revolutions, and changed how entire continents moved. But hidden in this timeline are material failures, bitter rivalries, and breakthroughs that risked everything if they went wrong. What did it take to turn primitive timber into the backbone of high-speed civilization? And why did each step in this journey matter more than you would expect? In the dim corridors of medieval German mines, wooden rails shaped the earliest guided paths for heavy ore carts. Miners set down thick oak planks, sometimes six feet long, to ease the load and keep wheels from sinking into the earth. These rails did not just cut friction. They allowed a single worker to move far more material than before. By the 16th century, English wagonways borrowed the same principle, laying timber rails across open ground in places like Shropshire. Guidance became a pressing concern. Carts tended to wander off track, so inventors hammered wooden pins into the rails creating a primitive steering system that kept wagons aligned. The Brosley track, an early 1600s example, used gravity to roll coal down to the River Severn, with each trip wearing deep grooves into the planks. But wood was never a perfect answer. Rain and rot softened rails, while heavy carts chewed up the surface, leaving ruts and splinters. Maintenance was constant. As loads grew, Wooden rails were capped with iron straps in some districts, but these too wore out quickly or peeled away under stress. The struggle to keep carts running straight and true shaped every improvement. By the 1760s, the Coal Brookdale Company in England introduced cast iron plates, flat L-shaped strips, bolted onto wood. This plateway let wagons roll on flat wheels, while the upturned edge of the plate kept them from slipping sideways. It was a clever fix for debris and misalignment, but cast iron brought its own problems, including brittleness and short rail lengths. A breakthrough arrived in 1789, when William Jessop devised the edge rail. Instead of guiding wagons with L-shaped plates, Jessop added a flange directly to the wheel. Now the smooth iron rail could be laid in longer, straighter lines, and the wheel itself handled the guidance. This seemingly small change had sweeping effects. Less debris clogged the track, and the entire system could finally support heavier, faster movement. Yet even with these advances, the search for a tougher, more resilient rail material was just beginning. The limitations of wood and early iron overlays made clear that something stronger would be needed for the next chapter in railway history. In 1820, John Birkinshaw patented a new kind of rail, wrought iron rolled in lengths of 15 feet. This breakthrough replaced the brittle three-foot cast iron sections that shattered under the pounding of early locomotives. Birkinshaw's rails flexed instead of snapping, absorbing shock and carrying heavier loads with far fewer failures. Business records from Bedlington Ironworks show that by the late 1820s, these longer rails were being ordered in bulk for mainline construction, despite initial doubts from mine owners wary of higher costs. The difference was dramatic. Derailments from fractured rails dropped sharply and the need for constant repairs faded. Wrought iron's ductility meant rails could be joined more securely, and the entire track could withstand the vibration and weight of steam engines that would have destroyed cast iron. Yet even wrought iron had limits. As train tens grew faster and heavier, rails began to bend and wear under relentless traffic. The next leap came in 1856, when Henry Bessemer introduced a process for mass-producing steel. By blowing air through molten iron, Bessemer stripped away impurities and created a metal far stronger and more consistent than anything before. This innovation delivered a new level of strength in rail material. 
1857, Robert Forrester Muschet refined Bessemer's process by adding Spiegeleisen, a manganese-rich iron, to control carbon content and toughness. Muschet's steel rail, laid at Derby Station, lasted over 16 years, 10 times longer than the best wrought iron. Inspectors at the Midland Railway documented its endurance, noting that the steel rail showed minimal wear even after years of heavy use. Modern steel rails are engineered with precise chemistry, typically 0.4 to 0.8% carbon, 1.3 to 1.4% manganese, and small amounts of chromium or vanadium for extra hardness. These alloys resist fracture, support higher speeds, and stretch rail life far beyond what iron could deliver. The ability to roll rails in longer, heavier sections, up to 30 feet and beyond, reduced the number of joints, cutting down on maintenance and the risk of failure. The steel rail's strength and resilience laid the foundation for the vast interconnected railway systems that would soon span continents. Track gauge once defined the fortunes of entire rail networks. In early 19th century Britain, George Stevenson's gauge of 4 feet 8 and a half inches became the benchmark for efficiency, while Isambard Kingdom Brunel's broad gauge of 7 feet and a quarter of an inch carved a separate path through the southwest. The rivalry peaked in the 1840s, as manufacturers and politicians debated which width would shape the country's future. Resolution came in 1846, when Parliament passed the Gage Act, mandating Stevenson's measurement for all new British lines. This decision allowed trains to move seamlessly between cities, laying the groundwork for a unified national system. By 1937, the UIC set 1,435 millimeters as the international standard, making Stevenson's gauge the backbone of global railways. Rails alone, though, could not ensure safe or reliable travel. Sleepers, known as ties, anchor the rails and maintain the gauge. Around 1900, timber accounted for about 90% of sleepers worldwide. Oak, pine and beech flexed under heavy loads and absorbed vibration, but wood decayed in wet ground and burned easily. Engineers turned to concrete, experimenting with early designs that struggled with cracking and weight. By the mid-20th century, pre-stressed concrete sleepers became the answer, lasting 40 to 50 years and resisting rot and fire. Concrete now dominates high-speed and heavy-haul lines, while timber remains on lighter roots and in difficult soils. Beneath the sleepers lies the ballast, a bed of crushed granite or limestone, carefully graded for drainage and stability. Ballast spreads the weight of passing trains, absorbs vibration, and channels away water. Without properly graded ballast, tracks would buckle and deform under the pounding of locomotives. Tamping machines periodically restore the ballast's shape and keep rails aligned, a routine especially critical on busy main lines. The fish plate, patented in 1842 by William Bridges Adams, replaced unreliable butt joints. Bolted to the sides of adjoining rails, fish plates allowed for longer, stronger track, but every joint remained a vulnerability. The next step was eliminating joints entirely and creating truly continuous rails. By the 1960s, rail engineers set out to erase the last major weak point, the joint. Continuous welded rail, often called CWR, replaced the old bolted segments with seamless steel, stretching for kilometers without a single break. The process relied on flash butt welding, fusing rail ends under intense heat and pressure to create a bond as strong as the steel itself. This eliminated the familiar clickety-clack of passing wheels and slashed maintenance. But it introduced a new challenge, thermal expansion. Rails laid in cool weather could buckle dangerously under summer heat. To prevent this, teams anchored rails at a carefully chosen stress-free temperature, 
typically between 21 and 27 degrees Celsius. The entire trackbed was engineered to absorb expansion, with anchoring systems and dense, well-compacted ballast holding the line in place. Early trials were not without risk. British rail records from the 1960s document buckling incidents that forced emergency protocols and rapid advances in installation techniques. The lessons proved invaluable as CWR became the backbone of high-speed rail. Modern lines routinely support trains running at 300 km per hour, speeds made possible only by the smooth, jointless path of welded rail. Inspection technology kept pace with track evolution. Laser geometry cars, travelling at full line speed, scan the rails for the tiniest misalignment, while ultrasonic sensors probe deep inside the steel for hidden cracks. The digital revolution now reaches every sleeper and rail. IoT sensors monitor strain, temperature, and movement in real time, streaming data to control centers. In July 2019, a network of sensors on France's LGV Sud Est line detected abnormal rail movement during a record heat wave. The system triggered an automated alert, and an emergency brake averted a potential derailment. Maintenance teams responded within minutes, guided by live diagnostics rather than guesswork. Looking ahead, the groundwork laid by CWR and digital monitoring supports even more ambitious projects. Maglev lines, already tested above 500 km per hour, rely on similar principles. Precision alignment, real-time feedback, and the elimination of mechanical joints. The evolution from clattering iron to silent, sensor-laden steel has not just raised the bar for speed and safety. It has redefined what a railway can be. Every day, over 280,000 kilometers of track carry billions worldwide. As high-speed rail and digital monitoring accelerate, the foundations beneath us still evolve. The next leap in railways isn't just about speed, it's about connecting more lives, efficiently and sustainably, on rails that never stop adapting.